to start with a survey, please. How many people can hear me? How many people can hear me but are still talking because they're not paying attention? Okay, good, good, good. I've always had this welcome screen, well, for a long time. And if you've never been up to Parliament, you really should go and, and do a tour. It's free. You can get tickets just across the street. Look for the Terry Fox Memorial. It's right behind there if it hasn't changed location. But it is a stunning piece of architecture. It has great stories behind it. Um, this bit right at the back here. So this is the center block. This is the Peace Tower. This is the Library Dome. If you look at a, uh, um, a straight down f image of it, the two are connected by a narrow hallway. And when fire broke out, Someone from the library closed the doors, and that saved the library and all the books in it. And so that's the only original part of the Peace Tower. Everything else was just destroyed and rebuilt. Um, they've got um, great tours and images of all that stuff that happened, and there's just amazing stonework and stuff. And the reason I'm mentioning this is I've always had the welcome, but this year I decided to add up the home bit. And w why, why I feel it's home is because most of us work remotely, most of us contribute to the project remotely, and coming here or any conference like this is sort of coming home. You're with people that you work with all the time. It's very familiar. Um, I, I find it very rewarding getting together with all these people, and it's, it's a way to recharge your batteries. So, welcome to the 14th. Um, is there anyone here that was at the first BSG Can in 2004? Yeah. Okay, so you'll, you'll all remember that I teared up at the final talk. And that was mostly a combination of the applause that came out and the sort of, holy fuck, it's over. <laughs> because that, that, that was the most stressful conference. After that, it, it's all gotten easier, except for um, the period right between the call for papers go out and the first couple of papers come in. Because it, it's hockey stick, I swear. It's like this, like this, like this. Oh shit, no one's going to give a talk. And then bang, <laughs> it all comes in. So about this session, we always have to thank the sponsors. If you remember BSG Can 2004, it was vastly different to this. For the first year and the first couple of years thereafter, we all traipsed up to the Royal Oak to have dinner. And one time we traipsed down to the sports pub in the sports, yeah. No, that took a lot of time. It took two hours for us to go and get our lunch. We had a good time, but it was, it was time consuming. So we're gonna go through some of the points and we're gonna have the keynote, and then we're gonna go on to the talks. So our sponsors, our platinum sponsors this year, we have three, IX Systems, Intel, and EMC. Not just for these sponsors, but all the sponsors. If you have contact with them, please tell them thank you. There is so much that we can do with sponsors that we just cannot do without sponsors. Netflix, TarSnap, FreeBSD Foundation, VeriSign, NetGate, Backtrace, and NetBSD Foundation are, are contributing this year. Nets Comuna. Thank you. Yeah. I was schooled by the Germans last year, last night, <laughs> and I'm surprised I remember. Scale Engine, Alan's right here. Um, Blackberry are here. Uh, people from outside of, of Canada may not uh, be aware of how big Blackberry here is in Canada, both as, a, as an employer and as um, a company itself, sorry. Um, Latrobe, is that the right? Latrobe Community Health, they, they're, they're helping out. Ziplink, Damon Security, Microsoft are here. I know one of the guys working for them. I'm glad they're here. Sys5 and Gandhi are here again. Everyone knows that Gandhi gives discounts to FreeBSD developers, and I'm sure anyone else that's involved with an open source project, I believe you get category E pricing, which is significantly less than category A. Uh, a few quick points of order. Well, yeah, we'll have the keynote. Lunch is at 12.15, grab it and go into the BOFs. The BOFs are listed on the website. They should be up to date now. It's gonna be snacks, 
there's Doc Sprints, but now they've been renamed. It's now the Doc Lounge. Uh, I'm not sure it's 11.20 tonight. I think that's wrong. The schedule is correct. My slide is out of date. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Hacker Lounge tonight will be in Henderson, 202 Henderson. It's down that way. It's on the map. Follow all the other people. Tomorrow morning, don't show up so early. Show up about 9 o'clock. There'll be food and drink there, but the talks don't start until 10. Don't get confused by that. We start later on Saturday by design. <laughs> we have not one but two hacker lounges this year. So we had L140, and we couldn't get L140 Friday and Saturday night. L140 is at 90 University. It's on the ground floor. Tonight and tomorrow night, it's in Henderson, 202 Henderson. I saw it. I think Henderson will actually be a better hacker lounge than L140 is. It's bigger and it's prettier. They have four blocks of power instead of those two. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> to the hacker lounge, bring your own extension cord, leave it, leave it tidy. It's Henderson. It's Friday and Saturday night. Last person to leave, lock up. Doesn't really apply because you can't lock up. <laughs> Boffs today. Uh, there's Tor in the BSDs. Uh, the person that was going to lead that can't make it. Someone else can lead it if they want. Poudrier Boff is going to be about building appliances, uh, disk images, ISOs, stuff like that with Poudrier. There's a sponsors Boff where the sponsors have some stuff to tell you. There's an amateur radio and SCR Boff. Tomorrow there's a ZFS and a Bug Boff, BSD users group. So if you don't want your registration bag, take it back to the registration desk, the tote bag. We give it away to the Ottawa Mission. They use it. Um, if you don't need your lanyard afterwards, some people collect them. I do. But if you don't need your lanyard, bring it back. I, I give it away to uh, a friend in Pennsylvania who then takes it to summer camps for disabled kids. Closing session. Bring your cash, credit card, all that stuff. Who has never? Who is here for the first BSD camp? Thank you. Welcome to BSC Town. Now, did the charity auction start the first year? I don't, I don't recall. But what we, no. no? Started a couple of years after. And what we did is someone said, do you want to auction this off? And I said, sure. And I think every year we've auctioned it off and the, and the proceeds go to the Ottawa Mission. And it's very interesting, the things that we can sell, which are, <laughs> which are of arguably very little value, but highly regarded by the people buying them. <laughs> Sorry? Are you wearing shirts? I'm wearing two shirts to the closing <laughs> session. <laughs> well, the first one will be less value than the second one, I'm sure. <laughs> but as you know, when I say it's first or second or last or second last, it's not always the item you think it is. All right. The, yeah, you can bid four against the last shirt, okay? And whoever wins, wins, but both of you get to pay and it all goes to charity. Um, the closing socials tomorrow night, it's at the red line, it's right after the closing uh, charity auction. And feedback, make sure you go in, give feedback on all the talks, please. That helps both the speakers and the program committee to decide what you want to see next year. And uh, Adam, hands up. Adam, Adam's here. If you ever have any trouble booking a hotel, if the hotel tells you something different from what's on the website, email us, please. Um, don't feel free to talk about it on Twitter and email and stuff. But unless you email us, we can't get back to the hotel and say you're doing the freaking wrong thing. You're not telling that, you're not telling our attendees what you told us. Okay? Because if it comes from us, we can complain to them and they fix it. Yes. Yep. For the recording, basically, let us know as soon as you encounter the problem because that gives us time to fix it before other people encounter the same problem. Uh, any quick questions? Sir? Work in progress session. Work in progress session. Oh, uh, there is, is there one set? Is there one on the schedule? Yes. Yes. Uh, we announced it. Okay. Uh, Michael, please send me an email to add it to the schedule. I'm sorry. I, th I think we've, okay, we'll add that in. Good point, thank you. George. Where's the chemistry lab? <laughs> <laughs>
George asked, where's the chemistry lab? George, why do you need to know where the chemistry lab is? <laughs> 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 why is the sky blue? Yeah. A any other relevant questions? <laughs> I was told a few months ago not to read Git Commit, uh, Git Commit Murder before the conference, and I'm beginning to hear why. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait. Out of order. All right. We're going to change this. Now, I'm sure all the Canadians have heard of Dr. Michael Geist before. I know I have. I've been a fan of his for quite some time, and if, if this is your first time hearing him speak, I'm sure you'll come away a fan as well. And I want to welcome Dr. Michael Geis for the keynote, BSD Can 2017. Could I use the mic? Do you want me to come on? Please, yeah. This one's for the room. Okay. And we're, we're doing a video recording, a CD recording on that one. This one's for the video. If I'm going to put it on. Everyone can hear me okay? Awesome. Great, well thanks so much um, for the invitation. Um, so I, this, is, this would be my first conference too, and you can just feel how, what a, a sen the sense of community that exists here. Um, so it's pretty special to have the chance to have been invited into this community. Um, and I'm grateful that you've been willing to allocate the start of your conference to hear from a law professor, uh, <laughs> which may not be the usual thing. I don't know, going back to 2004. But nevertheless, it's nice that you've given me that time um, to, in a sense, make a pitch. And the pitch that I want to make is that there's a ton happening in the law and policy space that is, uh, that is directly affecting the future of technology, the future of the internet. Uh, and that we need your voices. Uh, we need the voices, particularly from the techno techno technology community. I think we need broadly as many voices as possible on many of these issues. Um, I'm Canadian law prof. I work a few buildings away, not in the chemistry building, but uh, <laughs> yeah, a few buildings away. Um, and so, naturally enough, m many of the issues that I'm going to focus on will will start from a Canadian perspective. I've tried to bring in a little bit some of the international issues as well from the United States and elsewhere, but uh, there's a bit of a Canadian flavor. I'll start um, with an announcement that came from the Canadian government just a couple of days ago uh, from our formerly Minister of Industry, now it's called Innovation, Science and Economic Development, in which he announced that the government was delaying the implementation uh, of a piece of our anti-spam legislation. Now in the United States there was anti-spam legislation, Tan Spam Act going back um, more than a decade. Canada took a long time to debate the creation of its own anti-spam law. Government created a task force uh, back in 2004. I was a member of that task force. We had recommendations that came out in 2005 and it took almost 10 years uh, from the, the unanimous recommendations that include, included a broad range of participants to, to go from recommendations to implementation. Now there was one piece in that law that was delayed uh, given some of the concerns that business had, and it was a private right of action. And so the private right of action, of course, would allow individuals, companies, others to sue those behind spamming activities. Uh, and this would include not just spam, but include spyware, include ransomware, in theory, uh, someone who paid, let's say, in an instance of ransomware, and you identified the person behind this could sue uh, in an attempt to try to recoup some of the losses that all those people had sustained. Businesses objected to the, to the private right of action, the prospect of lawsuits over non-compliance uh, for, for non-compliance with the anti-spam law. And on Tuesday, the government in, uh, announced that they would be suspending until further notice, effectively killing the private right of action. Now, I should note that there are differences of views about this anti-spam law. I'm supportive of it, but certainly not everybody is. 
and that there has been much debate and attempts to try to delay and in a sense stop many aspects of the legislation that even predate this particular element of it. And so um, one of the things that was required was that companies were required to ensure that they had an opt-in informed consent before they could send commercial electronic messages. For the better part of a decade or more, many companies had been, uh, been adopting an approach in which people were less than fully informed, I'd say, about the fact that their email addresses were being used, collected, and then would be sent. And so why was Canada's anti-spam legislation several years ago creating so much spam? It was because there were many efforts to actually go back to people and say, you know what, we've been using your information, we'd like to continue to be able to send it. Um, and so that continued for some time. <laughs> and so you, had lo so you had lots of people who expressed concern about it, um, and that, that debate has been ongoing. Now I, I start with this particular example, not because that there's anything, not because of the debate itself, or even because of the government's decision, but actually instead because of a press release that the Canadian Marketing Association put out uh, on Tuesday, welcoming the industry minister, I said minister's announcement of killing this legislation. And as part of what they said was the Canadian Market Asso Marketing Association spearheaded a business coalition with the Chamber of Commerce to communicate with government policymakers concerned about the negative impacts. And then over the past several years, there have been a series of submissions leading to numerous meetings with officials in the minister's office to persuade the minister to act. Now, all of this is obviously true. Uh, it's been sort of well known, at least behind the scenes, that there has been a very active, quiet lobbying campaign. Though businesses, perhaps not so, not so surprisingly, have been reluctant to go on the record to say, we oppose strong enforcement of this anti-spam law. The, the starting point for the Chamber and for the Canadian Marketing Association, and frankly, for all the business groups who oppose this, is to start to say, we really like this anti-spam law, but. Um, and then the but is, can we try to eviscerate this as much as possible? <laughs> Now, I, as I say, I reference all this because this is, you know, lobbying out in the open. I mean, to me, it was, in a sense, almost remarkable to see one of the lead lobby groups on this issue not try to hide the fact that they were lobbying on this issue, but celebrating it. Now, I talked with the people in the minister's office, and I have, for me, an angriest post yesterday in which I take issue with a lot of what the minister had to say. He describes the private right of action as red tape and that it's unfair to... Uh, put businesses through red tape. I don't understand how an enforcement mechanism can be seen as red tape. He talks about charities not having to face this, but charities were exempted from the legislation uh, several years ago. And so there is the, he's basically feeding back a lot of what he'd heard from just one side of the story. Now, we would not, in an anti-spam context, expect millions of internet users to get up and lobby their politicians, their members of parliament, and say, hey, keep the law in place and ensure that it's adequately enforced. I mean, one of the real problems with these kinds of issues is that individually, there's very little incentive to ensure that those voices get out. But if you're a large business group, or at least organized around these kinds of coalitions, you can make this a top priority. You can afford to invest in it. You can ensure that multiple people spend lots of time meeting with ministers, meeting with, ministers of par meeting with members of parliament. And so that what comes out at the end of the day uh, is a minister who is almost repeating verbatim talking points of lobby groups in many instances which are entirely inaccurate. Now that's just one example of what's taking place, but I would suggest to you... <laughs> it's not going to stop. Can you keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay. No, I was going to ask if that's making going. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would suggest to you that this is far from... Um, sort of a, a, a unique situation. In yeah. fact, what's taken place, and apparently all these notifications too, not you. Uh, <laughs> Are we good? Uh, down, down to this little, it's this guy here. All right, all right, we're okay. Oh, okay, oh, yeah, cool. Now I'm going to present one. Uh, I I'd suggest to you this is far from a unique circumstance. Indeed, what I think one of the things that has typified much of tech policy making has been really a one-sided conversation. 
And one of the real challenges, I believe one of the most important challenges that we face are the missing voices or potentially really, the more voices and really what I would characterize as missing voices. It is particularly striking, and it's why I was so excited to have the chance to come and speak, that so often the technology community is almost entirely absent on some of these issues. Once in a while, people rally behind different issues. I'll reference net neutrality as an example in a moment. But for the most part, on many of these kinds of issues, people are busy with whatever ha they happen to do and don't necessarily see a place for themselves in the policy environment. And I should note, especially for the Canadians, it may be less true in, in other places, the ability to participate and to have an impact in all of this is significant. I've appeared for, I appear regularly before House of Commons committees on all sorts of issues, and I can tell you that in a number of circumstances, on security-related issues, on trade-related issues, the ability to ensure that your voice is heard, if you want to ensure that it is heard, is far greater than would otherwise be appreciated. In fact, I'll go off the, what I intended to say, just to give you one quick story. Uh, we were, at one point in time, active on copyright, and I'll come back to copyright towards the very end, very active on copyright law. I talked to a number of people at, in, on the Hill, at, at Parliament Hill here in Canada, asking how many letters did it take from constituents before an issue would capture the attention of the Member of Parliament. I have to say, as we were trying to, and we being a number of people sort of trying to blend these law, law technology policy and advocacy, as we were talking about this, we envisioned the prospect of these mass campaigns because surely we needed hundreds or thousands of people to speak out to their local member of parliament to ensure that it would get attention. And uh, one of the persons who's a seasoned veteran having dealt with riding MPs, members of parliament, in their constituency for a long time looked at us and said, well, listen, where we get letters from people, the first thing we do when we get a letter, and note that letters, at least at that time, where pay, people paid attention more to letters than they did to email. Uh, when we get a letter, the first thing we do is we take a look at the postal code. If the postal code is from our writing, it gets opened. If it's not, it goes into the blue bin for recycling. Uh, because what we are interested in hearing from is from our own constituents. Uh, because those, of course, are the people who ultimately vote for us. I said, okay, but how many of those letters do we need for you to pay attention? The answer was two. Two letters from people from within the riding was enough to get a member of parliament's attention because the notion was that if two people had taken the time to write about this issue, there surely were hundreds or perhaps thousands more within the riding that had the same views. Because of course the reality is people typically don't get actively engaged uh, in politics or in policy and if people are willing to take the time to do it, that sends a message. This doesn't take a lot, uh, but even getting to that point, even getting to the two, can sometimes be difficult. So what I want to do in the next 30 minutes or so is sort of breeze through 10 areas that I think are highly relevant in the law, techno law and technology space. Again, it's a bit from a Canadian perspective, but not exclusively so. So there's issues around access, of course. And many of us will take for granted the, the, uh, the, po the prospect that we have affordable high-speed broadband access, although there may well be some that live in communities where uh, even now, access represents a problem. In Canada, we've started to see a shift in this regard. Uh, we had, through our regulator, the CRTC, a decision last year, the basic services obligation, uh, which came up with the, with the notion that as we switch from what used to be a view of universal access to telephony, that now should move towards universal access to high-speed internet, to broadband internet, setting a target of 50, 50 down and I think 10 up is the number, is the, as what should be available to all. Uh, and the notion that we need to set into, in motion policies and funding and the like to ensure that that is accessible and available to all. <laughs> now, that regulator, the CRTC, has been actively involved in any number of different issues. Part of it, especially in the wireless space, trying to find mechanisms to ensure that we can have better levels of competition. The Canadian market is dominated by three large wireless providers, and it has been an ongoing effort from, from successive governments, this isn't a, a partisan political issue, um, trying to identify ways to ensure that we can inject more competition into the marketplace. And one way is to allow rivals, smaller independent players, to begin to roam on, their, on those networks. We've also seen it take place, and some of these debates take place within the context um, of fiber, and whether or not fiber lines ought to be shared when it comes to to broadband, and in fact, the regulator has moved forward in that direction. 
But once again, we saw efforts, in this instance unsuccessful, to try to lobby back this behind the scenes effort. And in many instances, the missing voices is an ongoing problem. So when the regulator here in Canada ordered that the, the framework that is used for wholesale access that allows independent providers, companies in Canada like Tech Savvy, to be able to ride on other networks, um, at least for the last mile purposes, to inject, inject a better level of competition or greater competition in the marketplace, which you saw was unsurprisingly efforts to try to push back. So companies like Bell, one of the largest, one of the large players in Canada, appealing to the government and looking to as many uh, of people within its ecosystem, and that included technology companies, Cisco, for example, uh, was one of the companies who sells gear to Bell and who was then willing uh, to write to the government, urging them to overturn what the regulator had done. And so when you've got companies like the technology companies, technology companies like Cisco, along with Bell, along with even basic community groups and charities that have looked to a large vertically integrated company that has large broadcasting properties and telecom properties, and suddenly they turn around and say, hey, we need your voice to tell the government to, turn, to, to overturn this decision, they come forward and they say exactly that. In fact, we even had mayors of cities, including here in Ottawa and in Toronto, writing, they said, on their own behalf to the government, um, urging the government to overturn that decision. Now, ultimately, they chose not to do so. Uh, there was efforts, even in some city councils, interestingly, in the city of Toronto, I don't know if there's anyone here from Toronto, but you may know that there was an effort within city council upon learning the fact that the mayor there, John Tory, had written this letter, which sure looked like a letter on behalf of the city, but he claimed no, it wasn't. And it, as it turns out, as you may, it's also relevant that he's a former executive from one of the big three. Um, and, he, and so he wrote this letter on, on, he said on his own behalf, city council put forward a motion in a sense directly rejecting it, which was successful. Ottawa tried to do the same thing, and by that point in time, Bell had gotten wise to what had taken place in Toronto and was able to successfully lobby against the motion here in Ottawa. And so that, that, that particular case where a regulator conducts its hearing, recognizes the need for greater access and fostering more levels of competition, and yet the level and the amount of lobbying that takes place, often without public voices, is truly significant. There's, of course, the net neutrality issue, which we hear about a lot, and in some ways provides sort of the, the crystallizes public engagement, at least earlier on, on these sorts of issues. And in, particularly in the United States today, um, as I'm sure many of you will know, in the, under the Trump administration, we're seeing a significant shift that take place uh, within the FCC and a dramatic move to move away from some of the open internet principles and certainly the approach to net neutrality that we'd seen um, under President Obama. Now, it's not limited just to uh, the United States. There was, in the aftermath of the terrorist attack in the UK several days ago, um, discussion from Theresa May, who didn't do so well last night, uh, about, what she, about the kinds of things that she might, the kinds of steps that she might take. I mean, I thought quite remarkably, she, she I believe, talked about the, the notion that if human rights and civil rights were creating a problem to uh, encountering terrorism, then we needed to get rid of human rights and civil, those human rights and civil rights to ensure uh, that there was effective security measures. It seems like there were plenty of people who preferred to get rid of her. Uh, <laughs> is, is the same thing. I am that this, this takes place on a, this is taking place on a global basis. Uh, although in Canada, we've done very, very well with respect to net neutrality. Um, and so we've had both the regulator strongly support net neutrality, most recently in a decision involving zero rating, uh, again standing up for net neutrality, and so our regulator stood for it, and so too has the government, which has consistently talked about the importance of net neutrality and injected it very frequ frequently into the, the conversation. As you may know, there are efforts to try to push back it in the United States on this issue, uh, although we'll have to see how successful it happens to be with an event plan for, June 12, for July 12th, so almost exactly a month from now, uh, with many of the larger companies taking place. And there is an enormous amount of pressure on these companies not to take those positions. You may, you may have seen just over the last few days a fair amount of media coverage over the fact that Amazon is one of the participating organizations here and expressing surprise that, they would be, that they're, they've been willing to do so. Um, it support, I would argue, supporting those positions and supporting those companies that, have been will, that are now willing uh, to speak out on these issues and perhaps provide some counter momentum to what we've seen is, I think, really valuable. There's the security-related issues, which 
are pretty significant. And I do this one I do want to, in a sense, to drill down a little bit further, especially from a Canadian perspective, as illustrative of what may be happening in a lot of different places. We've had, you may know, the terrorist attacks uh, are something that, that lots of too many countries have now experienced, and we experienced one here a number of years ago on Parliament Hill, exactly in the in the spot with, with the, the picture that, uh, that you were shown off the top. And in fact, um, when you go on, if you, should you go on that tour, I don't know if they've cleaned it up now, but some of the bullet holes, because the shooter was able to penetrate into the building, some of the bullet holes that took place just outside the library, which is where one of the final shootouts, so to speak, took place, uh, were still there. So this is a serious issue. I was on campus on another building the day it happened. And, um, I can recall there are lots of, of course, lots of rumors and stories taking place and the shooter, we're not very far from there. Shooter is coming down, they're entering campus, all of those sorts of things. And so unsurprisingly, government responds with highly restrictive new security measures. Um, a, a not an uncommon response for many governments. Um, surprisingly, I think, to the government and to others, though, the public became actively engaged. And at a time when it's very difficult to get the general public to focus on privacy-related issues, we ultimately found something that people did start thinking about. It was called Bill C-51. And in fact, the last national election that we had, this particular bill and the surveillance measures and the security measures that the government had introduced became a, an issue in a national election. I'm not going to tell you it was the defining issue by any means, but it was unquestionably an issue. We ended up with a new government, the liberal government, who took a position in which they said they, there were things they didn't like about C-51, there were things that they, they did like, and so what they were going to do was consult the public. They put forward this consultation document last year, which was billed, I think, and viewed by many as being this consultation effort to decide what to do with Bill C-51. And in fact, that consultation has now concluded, they've actually put forward uh, the summary or the release of what the public had to say, and I think Unsurprisingly, the public largely said they were uncomfortable with many of the measures that the government had adopted. What remains to be seen is whether or not that consultation was consultation theater, uh, in which you say, we want to hear what the public has to say, and then you just go ahead and do whatever you were planning to do anyway, uh, or whether or not uh, they actually take this to heart and decide that it's, you know, the, the public has spoken and we've got to find a way to better craft the balance between these two issues. But what, to me, what was notable about this particular document was not the fact that the government had gone forward and engaged in this debate. It was all of the issues that they actually buried in the document that had nothing to do with Bill C-51. And so in a Canadian context, for example, as part of the C-51 debate, they now included an issue around what's known as lawful access. Lawful access speaks to the circumstances under which law enforcement should be able to the obtain information on subscribers, um, internet subscribers, often without a warrant. So under what circumstances do telecom companies, ISPs, disclose information about their subscribers or subscriber activity, uh, potentially without court order? And there's a couple of other issues there. This was also the subject of a long-standing debate in Canada, a uh, better part of 10 years. It was actually, one of, for me, one of the best instances of where we desperately needed people with technical expertise to appear before uh, parliamentary committees, because I remember I appeared before it as did a bunch of other people focusing on the privacy implications of disclosing metadata, um, and you had members of parliament who simply didn't get it. Um, from their perspective, they understood why there might be pri privacy implications for the content of a message, but they could not get their head around the potential disclosures and the privacy import of the metadata uh, associated with those messages. And having more expertise to, to, to make that clear, I think would have been valuable. Now, lawful access was put to bed in a piece of legislation that was ultimately passed by the prior conservative government with fairly restrictive rules, although it was an interesting debate and it's worth a talk all on its own. And yet included within this consultation is the prospect of bringing these same issues back again. So for example, around the, the question of should basic subscriber information be disclosed by ISPs and telecom companies, if we go back a number of years, one of the early bills in Canada on lawful access included all of these, said that basic subscriber information, which those supporting the legislation said it's nothing, it's just like the phone book, that's all we're requiring you to disclose. I've yet to see a phone book that includes this much information. Um, and they said this, w this was the information that ought to be mandatorily disclosed without any court oversight. And so it was name addresses, you could say email address, IMEI numbers, 
uh, which raises questions about people about law enforcement using stingrays, being able to capture IMEI numbers, and then going back to providers and saying, I've got these lists of device numbers in a sense, tell me who the subscriber is. Uh, and by the way, tell me their address and tell me their email address, all information that should be, that under this piece of legislation would have been mandatorily disclosed, no court oversight at all. That was an early proposal. It was a proposal that actually ultimately went down. Over time, they slowly started eliminating some of the, low, the stuff towards the bottom and ultimately actually eliminated mandatory disclosure altogether. Uh, but the government put it back on the agenda. And they said, we've got to start thinking about this again. They did it in part because of the Supreme Court of Canada decision, a case known as the Spencer decision, uh, in which the Supreme Court of Canada, after years of debate around whether or not there really was privacy associated with that basic subscriber information, the Supreme Court of Canada said, sure there is. They said, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, not just with the content of your messages, but with your identity as well. Because tying your identity along with things like your IP address or other sorts of information can tell a whole lot about you. And so disclosing that without appropriate privacy oversight and protections is simply a, is a violation of the law. Law enforcement now turns around and says this decision is creating a lot of problems for us because suddenly now we have to go out and get warrants where previously ISPs were willing to disclose this information. Now from my perspective, that's a feature, not a bug. Um, but nevertheless, from a law enforcement perspective, they would take a look, they're, they're looking at this and say, what we need is to change, if the court ruled this, we need to come back and we need to create a system in which information is mandatorily disclosed. And so it raises all sorts of issues as to whether or not this will be warrantless information, what information might be disclosed, and under what circumstances. There are a number of other questions that have come up as well, questions about data retention, how long should providers be required to store information, for what purposes, uh, and who might have access to that information. We had an instance in Canada, uh, here in Ottawa actually, just last year, in which it was a, a murder case, an investigation on a murder case that had gone cold. And so the last time the victim of this, of the murder had been seen, it was located not far from where I live, in the west end of Ottawa, um, near the Costco. So I'm there a lot, and the last time, I, I like Costco, and so the last time, <laughs> This last time this person was seen was on a Saturday um, in and around one of the parking lots right, right by there. I can be seen there a lot as well. So law enforcement is sort of reached, cold, turned out that the investigative trail had been cold. The last thing that they had, or really the only thing they had, is this is the last time um, this person has been seen. And so their challenge, nine months later, is how do you restart this investigation? What they're able to do is they go to court, obtaining court orders, so courts involved, a court order to go to the big three telecom companies and give us, and what, it, what they ask for is give us the tower dump information, give us all the information from your cell phone towers on this particular day at this particular time um, in this area. In other words, we want to know from nine months ago, uh, everyone who had a cell phone uh, that, that had called into that tower at that particular moment. Uh, or within that particular timeline. Companies provided that information. Law enforcement put out a press release that they were about to send text messages to all the phone numbers that showed up there asking if they had any recollection or any information about this particular person or recall anything on that particular day. Now that's pretty tough to expect anyone nine months later is gonna remember this on a random basis, but that's the effort. Now, there were people that were surprised to, to, to see this investigative technique, but so be it. For me, the surprise was telecom companies had basic tower information, geographical location-based information of the users, storing it for nine months uh, about who was located, about everybody who had called into that particular tower. And we know, of course, that they, this information is, reta is retained for a certain period of time. The law doesn't speak to how long this information should be retained. But the notion that it is there and available months and months later reals, raises, I think, real questions about what the appropriate standard ought to be. The laws, the prior laws, and once again the government, puts on questions about network interception capabilities too. And so earlier versions of this lawful access included a whole range of requirements and in a sense created a full regulatory framework for network providers talking about interception capabilities, talking about disclosing who was involved in running those networks, potential 
criminal background checks on those people, ensuring that information was available to our national police uh, so that in the event they needed access to this information, they needed it quickly, they'd have the ability to obtain all of that. Now, much of this never went forward either, in part because nobody wanted to pay for it. Telecom company said, we're not paying for it. The government said, we don't have a budget to pay for it, and so it didn't move forward. In fact, they argued that this was necessary to counter terrorism, but then recognized that uh, it would be particularly difficult for smaller network providers to pay for this. So they said, we'll create an exemption for the smaller network providers for a series of years, as if would-be terrorists don't read the news either and couldn't figure out <laughs> that if you were going to communicate, one way to avoid this would be simply to, to, to use a network provider that didn't face these same sort of mandates. But this issue has also been placed back on the agenda, questions about who pays what networks and what regulation. And finally, they brought back the issue that I think many had thought had been put to bed back in the 1990s around the prospect of backdoors for encryption. Much of this, of course, coming out of the now infamous incident uh, in San Bernardino, California, and the efforts to require Apple um, briefly to provide a backdoor to one of, its, uh, one of its iPhones. And the same questions raised again, questions that have been raised, I think, repeatedly, and I think answered well about the fact that if we create backdoors, it's not just the good guys that uh, gain, potentially gain access, but the bad guys too. Um, and yet that possibility raised again by the Canadian government about backdoors and products and services. It's an issue that as so in certain respects has been uh, percolating behind the scenes. We had reference to the fact that BlackBerry, um, the research in motion, major Canadian, major Canadian company, still too, uh, as you heard, a large employer. But of course, they for many years faced many of these kinds of questions as they sought to go into different markets and there were demands uh, behind the scenes for access to those backdoors. So lots of, lots of these kinds of issues playing themselves out now in real time. I'm going to go a bit quicker just to highlight the last bunch. Um, we have issues in Canada, and you see these playing out in Europe especially as well, around, new, around looking to tax internet, internet access and internet services often as a mechanism to try to, fund, to provide new funding for culture-based activities. So, in Canada, um, we've seen a lot of talk about taxing or putting levies on internet providers or on services like Netflix. And the argument is that that funding would then go to create more Canadian content. And so we've seen it raised in the, pro in the context of internet services, um, which I think it's, I, I, from my perspective, runs directly counter to the objective that I talked about earlier, almost off the top, affordable universal internet access, um, affordability, takes a bit of a hit when you start layering on to everybody's bills additional fees that will go towards CanCon. We've seen additional, we've seen those kinds of efforts play out in a number of different ways. Also sometimes described as Netflix tax. This was an incredibly cheesy video uh, put out by our former Prime Minister Harper that tried to make him, uh, I think, try, was both a declaration that there would be no Netflix tax, no levy on Netflix, and also an attempt, I think, to seem uh, kind of with it um, for people who are accessible. Um, turns out he likes Breaking Bad. Uh, <laughs> or at least, at least that, that's what he said. That's, it's his equivalent of what you may have seen the, the meme that went around with Theresa May uh, when they asked, what, what have you done that's been naughty? Uh, and she couldn't come up with anything until she said running through the wheat field. Uh, and so there's been a lot of that. Somebody yesterday said, now you've done something that's more naughty than running through the wheat fields and calling for an election. Uh, in any event, um, so we have a lot of talk around that. There's also sometimes talk about basic taxes, not just uh, cultural taxes, but just simply basic taxes, and that is a bit more reasonable. You pay service taxes on lots of different products. The notion that we should exclude um, digital services, I think, does raise certain questions. Uh, but you do see more and more talk around. Um, okay, uh, more and more talk around. Uh, taxing uh, and regulating these sorts of online services. Okay, good stuff. Okay. All right, a couple, few more. Uh, I want to talk about potential liability for linking, and this, in fact, got, this moved forward just like yesterday um, in the European Union from at least one one uh, committee within the European Parliament. Uh, the idea here for some is that. At sites that conduct aggregation, Google News and the like, uh, especially in Europe, but increasingly elsewhere, are seen as taking away revenue from news sites and other kinds of services. And so 
Um, the bright idea that some of the new services that are struggling had is they say, why don't you, we force people to pay every time they link into one of our articles. Now, of course, especially if you are ad-based, it's the link that's actually providing you with the revenue in the first place. Uh, and so that ability to, to, to capture that revenue strikes many, I think, as um, poorly thought out. But nevertheless, we're seeing efforts to move forward with that in Europe. And there has been, you should know, some discussion of doing the same here in Canada. Our large media organizations are struggling. And so at a committee hearing um, less than a year ago, you had one newspaper association say, if you click through the journalist story, then perhaps it's, uh, then at that point, perhaps the journalist and the newspaper should receive a payment. There are ways to get at this. And so micropayments, anytime anybody clicks, this is just a terrible idea. Um, but nevertheless, efforts to either create link taxes or look to things like copyright, and we will be conducting a copyright review in Canada later this year as a mechanism to help save the newspaper industry. To take a look at where people are spending their time, it's obvious what the newspaper industry's problem is, uh, just people don't spend as much time reading the physical paper. Uh, copyright, I don't think, will save this, but link taxes will cause enormous harm uh, to all sorts of different sites. There are similarly targets right now on virtual private networks. I'm sure many people, not everybody here, uses VPNs regularly. Uh, lots of reasons to use VPNs from a privacy and security perspective, um, but we are seeing more and more countries begin to focus on VPNs, especially in the context of people trying to access new, different Netflix libraries. Um, and so Netflix is now available in more than 100 countries here in Canada. Uh, when they first came, the available titles were pretty limited, and so people were anxious to use VPNs to make it seem as if they were coming from the United States to access the U.S. Netflix library. That's become less of an issue over time because Netflix uh, has more and more Netflix originals and has, has created larger libraries, but it remains an issue for many, as sometimes there's a specific title or thing you want to watch that's not otherwise available. Uh, and people turn to these VPNs. Netflix kind of allowed it to happen for a very long time until they went truly global and rights holders began to push back on the issue saying, we could live with Canada and Australia and a couple of other countries doing this, but if you're gonna operate in more than 100 countries worldwide, you need to buy a global license, not just a license for the United States. And what's that, what that has meant is that there's more and more talk about regulating VPNs. And in fact, we're even seeing efforts to pressure payment intermediaries to stop servicing some of these VPNs. So for example, PayPal, as an example, stopped providing payment services to some of, some of the VPNs that were seen as facilitating this, and there was pressure brought on Visa and MasterCard as well. So a lot of pressure on VPNs, and that the implications there, regardless of what you think about broader, better Netflix access, the implications of being able to stop people from being able to access VPN services for all the many reasons that VPNs are invaluable raises significant policy questions. There are also questions about whose law applies in many instances. This dates back to one of the very early cases, uh, probably one of the earliest internet related cases that many of you may remember. It came out of France in which Yahoo had sort of an online auction site trying to compete with eBay. There was Nazi memorabilia that was available on that site. The French, uh, French uh, action was brought in France arguing that the mere accessibility of these images and this content violated French law. French court agreed. Uh, they tried to bring it back and enforce it in the United States and were unable to do so. But that early case, it dates back, as you can see, all the way back to 2000, crystallized this question of under what circumstances do court orders or should court orders be able to be applied on a more broad, on a more broad basis outside of the particular jurisdiction. We're seeing lots of different courts grapple with this question. In Europe, this comes up within the context now of the right to be forgotten, uh, in which uh, a case that many of you may know, a case brought in, in Europe where someone said that search results uh, that were damaging to the, to the individual's reputation were still accessible through Google. The, the results were accurate, the information was legal, there was nothing unlawful about it, um, but what they wanted to do was make it more difficult to find by ordering Google to remove it from its search index. The European court agreed and, and found that there was within the privacy law a right to be forgotten. Um, and ordering, in this case, the search intermediary to remove it from its index. In the aftermath of that decision, we started to see some privacy regulators say, it's not good enough to limit this just to Europeans, but in fact, we want to see limitations of access more broadly uh, so that it's done on a global basis. 
And we had the same issue, effectively, appear before the Canadian Supreme Court. It's another place if we have time. It was really worth a visit. It's also right beside the Parliament buildings. Uh, they heard in December a case involving Google in which a British Columbia court had issued an order which they said should be applied on a global basis, ordering the removal of certain search results from Google globally. And the question before the Canadian Supreme Court, we don't have an answer yet, the court hasn't issued its ruling, is whether or not the court order should be limited just to British Columbia or just to Canada, or whether a Canadian court, like any other court, should be entitled to um, apply this on an international or broader basis. Again, the signal that there's five minutes. Uh, so in the last five minutes, three, more, three last things. Data localization, big, big issue increasingly as people take a look at surveillance-related activities, raise questions about whether or not one way to try to better protect privacy is to ensure that the data remains within the jurisdiction. This becomes a big issue, especially in a post-Trump environment, not post-Trump, in a Trump environment. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not post yet. <laughs> I think we have to wait a little bit longer for that, I hope. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the, the issues, especially for other people, so one of the things you may know, one of the first executive orders that Trump signed was one scale, rolling back an interpretation that had tried to provide better levels of privacy protection for non-US citizens and permanent residents. Uh, and so that issue of where the data is stored and access to it raises real questions and concerns. In, in Europe, there, the, uh, the way to counter that, or the way that has been countered, has largely been through this fellow, Max Schrems. Um, he's a lawyer, former law student who, took, who got interested in privacy-related issues when doing a master's in the United States. He brought an action um, challenging the information sharing agreement, the safe harbor between the EU and the United States, based on the surveillance activities that take place in the US, and did so successfully. The European court struck down that agreement. There is now something known as the Privacy Shield, but there are ongoing questions about whether or not um, that those data flows are permissible. There's also website blocking. Um, Canadians may be surprised to learn, uh, if you haven't heard about it, that the Quebec government has passed legislation as part of a budget to block uh, mandating that ISPs block access to unlicensed online gambling sites. Uh, this is a straightforward cash grab. The Quebec government has its own licensed uh, online gambling site. It hasn't been meeting financial projections. Uh, and they're pretty open about this. Uh, and so what they did was they said, well, how can we do better? One way we can do better is to block the competition. And so uh, what they have ordered is a blocking of unregulated websites with ISP, ISPs once this takes effect, facing significant penalties for failing um, to follow through. The regulator has said you're not allowed to do this. There's a legal challenge as well. But that question of government mandated blocking isn't limited to the kinds of countries that you read about the Chinas of the world. We've seen it here too. And especially in a copyright context, you see it all around the world where copyright rights owners often argue for blocking of access to um, various kinds of sites. Finally, there's copyright. In Canada, we had long debates about these issues. We passed laws in 2012, and generally speaking, we did really, really well. This is a list of the, many of the various kinds of exceptions that Canada added within the legislation and expansion of fair dealing, which would be our version of fair use, a whole series of other basic exceptions. We have, for, we have a non-commercial user-generated content exception um, that protects people who create remix and mashup, um, both the creator of it as well as the platforms that store that information. We've got a an internet exception, so in a classroom like this, if material's available anywhere on the internet, so long as someone hasn't said they don't want to see it actively used under the exception, you're permitted to use it for educational purposes. So we did really well, but um, rights holders aren't happy about that, and in a copyright review schedule to, to start later this year, we're seeing headlines like this, kids will suffer if the legislation doesn't change. It's always think about the kids. Um, and so in this instance, the argument is you've got to roll back or scale back some of the openness provisions around fair dealing. The music industry is, of course, back, talking about the so-called value gap. Um, Canada's music scene, especially on streaming, has done exceptionally well, uh, but you know, nevertheless not well enough, at least according to the industry. And of course, there are always claims around uh, piracy and claims that somehow Canada is a piracy haven, even though the data doesn't bear that out at all. Uh, and so there is a need to speak out on this. Now, these are the kinds of issues that happens when you start, when law and policy start meeting technology. And so I will conclude by saying that as we look at all of these issues, 
Um, whether you're here or you're in another jurisdiction where these are taking place, we desperately need ideas. We need to be able to counter some of these policy issues or at least invoke informed ideas about what kind of policy uh, policies are appropriate. We need your expertise, but even most of all, we need your voice. And as these consultations happen and there are opportunities to speak out wherever you may happen to be, um, I'd really encourage you to do so. Thanks so much for your attention. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on uh, law enforcement and courts compelling password disclosure? And, well, we're seeing it. We're seeing it not just in, in the courts, but um, we're starting. To, we start to hear about this prospect at the border too. Just for the, just when you cross when you cross the border. In fact, there's a hearing that's taking place right now um, for the ethics committee, private ethics and privacy committee around at the border compelling that sort of disclosure. I think it raises real concerns as well. Uh, I'm not an absolutist on some of these issues, and so my starting point is to say we need to ensure first and foremost that there is uh, oversight um, around some of these things, and then certainly in a border context, you don't get that sort of oversight. It's you and the customs official, uh, and very often you feel quite helpless. Uh, in other circumstances, one can understand why in certain circumstances there would be a need to disclose, but one would hope, A, that there's this is always done on a warranted basis and that there's an understanding uh, of those within the warrant that create the appropriate limitations both in terms of access and use. Um, so I don't know that we can create an environment where we say there's simply never any access, there's no circumstances uh, where law enforcement should be entitled to do it. My concern, at least the way this has played out in Canada, is that we get law enforcement who are doing the best they can in these circumstances too often arguing that all of these steps to ensure that there is appropriate levels of oversight are simply slowing things down or making it too difficult and what we need to do is eliminate uh, all of that kind of oversight. That's where, from my perspective, the problem lies. I saw, I saw your hand and then I guess your hand. Um, so inside open source oh. communities, there's often a lot of passion and enthusiasm for these kinds of issues, um, but maybe not a strong sense of the most effective way to engage. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what kind of suggestions would you have for open source communities in terms of practical steps for trying to have our voices be heard? That's a great question. And so there, there's what, what I think you can do both individually and then as a community. And as, I'm, as, sort of, as I referenced earlier on, there is that ability on an individual basis to speak out. Um, it can be an intimidating thing to say I want to meet with my member of parliament. Um, the reality is they're non-expert in almost every circumstance in these areas, uh, and you have far more expertise than they will in many instances. And so uh, they're, in many instances, happy to learn, and they are also far more accessible. At least, you know, sort, of, uh, sort of harp on the Canadian side of the story, but um, I know when talking to some of my U.S. colleagues, they say that the ability to get a meeting with a U.S. senator is almost impossible. Um, getting a meeting with even a, your local representative from, from Congress requires a nice contribution, attending a breakfast and stuff like that. It's difficult. Um, that's not the case here. Um, and, I, I only, and I think it's not the case in a lot of other countries. Your MP will meet with you. Uh, they're in the riding. They're, they'll st within the next week or two, they will be in the riding for the better part of the next two months, um, spending time at barbecues and things like that. And the reality is they're accessible. Like in my own circumstance, my, my former MP was John Baird, who was our foreign minister, environment minister. Um, and, I, and I and I can recall uh, I was taking my kid to hockey camp uh, to a hockey game on play. He played, played hockey on a Saturday morning. And he was young; he was like eight or nine years old. Uh, and I saw I think it was on Twitter or something like that. I referenced the fact that Baird was holding a town hall uh, near where we were, and I said, and copyright was the issue at the time. I said, I told Ethan, my son, you know what? Let's go. You're going to see democracy in action. We'll go and see if we can get a minute with Baird as part of this town hall. And um, so I go in, we, we reduce the average age in the room by at least 15 years, uh, uh, because it tends to skew a bit older. Uh, but we go in, and Baird is there, and he knew who I was, because I do some columns and things like that. He gave me a few minutes, and then he said, you know what, let's, let's meet, because uh, I want to give you more time. And I met, I, he gave me 45 minutes in his office a week before he went to Copenhagen at the time he was the uh, environment minister for what was a major conference on the environment. Uh, it is, and I hear these kinds of stories repeatedly 
that the MPs, especially if they know that you're in the riding, will give you the time. So individually, I think it's about, frankly, it's nothing more than trying to make sure your voice is heard to your elected representative. Uh, as a community, though, it's clear this is a real community. And community voices can be really strong on these issues. And given that there is some amount of self-organization already, the opportunity to try to self-organize around issues that matter from policy perspective is there. For example, in the copyright context, we helped create a committee, we being uh, technology law public interest clinic that I established at this university, uh, we established sort of essentially frameworks, platforms for a number of different areas of peer, for people so that they could coalesce. And so we did it for, we created something known as a digital security coalition. We had a lot of help from a number of digital security companies in town and said, you know what, some of these issues um, will directly implicate you. You need to ensure that there is a voice. And, we helped them do a white paper, letters to members of parliament, and then efforts to try to ensure those voices are heard. There's a lot of power in ensuring that more stakeholders come out and, in a sense, provide some of these counters. So there's a lot you can do individually. And then there's, of course, even perhaps even more, potentially even stronger, is that kind of coalescing around uh, the community itself and speaking as a community on, on some of these issues. Sorry, I'll, I'll take the fellow with the two more, two more, because okay? I um, promised to asymmetry uh, of incentives uh, where the major players have legal departments whose job it is is to actively attack the, the surface uh, of, uh, of law. And so as a community, at best, we can be reactive, uh, you know, in, in speaking in the Canadian context, is are you aware of uh, how we can, you know, change footing or like start to become, uh, say, proactive or how do you, how do you, um, how do you sustain against uh, an advanced persistent threat? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, those are, and, and you raise at least a couple of issues there. One is how do you, how do, you do something other than always playing defense? Uh, and it does feel like very often almost all we're doing is playing defense. I do think that there is, at least within different policy environments, the opportunity to do some of that. So for example, I did a piece in the Globe, I write for the Globe now, pretty regularly, uh, talked about the need for a text and data mining exception. Um, and so the government's put a lot of emphasis on the potential for AI in Canada, um, and yet the, the restrictions that copyright law might create in terms of being able to engage in text and data mining and what those data sets look like creates a real world restriction for our competitiveness. So that's an attempt to try to put forward sort of proactive positive agenda, and we had some of that. I mean, if you, so user generated content exception didn't come out of nowhere, it came out of people saying that I, should I really be liable and face thousands in damages based on a video of my kid dancing or kind of some of my home movies that have some background music? Didn't make any sense to them. The ongoing persistent threat, though, is an incredible challenge, and I don't have a good answer for that. Um, the, so the groups on the other side play a long game, and so we see that, let's say, in the copyright context where they lost certain respects in 2012, but they are back and have been very active for 2017, whereas many of the groups that were successful in 2012 said, job here is done. Uh, and I don't have, I, and it, it just requires ongoing efforts to have commitment, but it's, it's an enormous challenge. So is there anything like, say, the EFF within a Canadian yeah. context whose job it is to kind of push forward the, uh, the opposite agenda? There is. Uh, so thanks. So if you are looking for a place to support, um, there are at least a couple of those groups. One is that public interest clinic that I mentioned uh, here at the University of Ottawa. It's called CIPIC, the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic. Um, they're actively involved in a whole range of issues. They brought the very first complaint against Facebook uh, on privacy grounds anywhere in the world and was successful in doing so. They appear regularly before Parliament and often appear before the courts uh, on an intervener basis. There's also Open Media, uh, which is a BC-based group that has been very successful, especially in the telecom space and on, on the surveillance space. So, we don't have EFF, but at least those two groups have, I think, been the, the most active, and plus the traditional civil liberties groups, CCLA and BCLA. Quickly, this last question. So, uh, should we worry about running a tour exit node in Canada? No, I don't. I, you know, one of the nice things, I, I, don't, I think the answer is no, uh, at least not right now. Um, and I think one of, one of the things that, that has been underrated is that Canada is a pretty good policy environment, or has been. Uh, on a lot of those kinds of issues. From privacy, security basis, encryption is a good example, actually. Um, we were far more progressive around uh, encryption exports uh, than the United States was. And so you had, 
at a certain point in time, it's like 20 years ago now, you had certain companies setting up shop uh, or locating here in part because there were fewer restrictions on these issues compared to what they face in other places. We're pretty good with respect to intermediary liability, not perfect, but pretty good generally speaking. Um, and so the sets of rule, and, and given that we don't have things yet around things like data retention and stuff like that, um, you know, in some ways it's, it's not a terrible thing not to have that in part because it doesn't set standards and so um, you can establish some of these kinds of services without a whole lot of concern. Now that we're part of five eyes, there's lots of pressure that's brought to bear and so that doesn't mean things won't change, but um, for the moment it's a pretty uh, healthy environment in that. So law enforcement are, in your experience, are they savvy enough if you say, listen, I'm running core, it's not, we're not responsible, we don't have any control, this is just a, a pipe that... My experience is that there are that the the problem that the far bigger problem law enforcement has faced, other rather than needing lots of new laws, has been that there are too many that don't have the resources or sophistication on some of these issues. So there are, there are some that are highly sophisticated. They are either on the within the national police forces or at least in a couple of the major cities. Um, once you get outside of that, there's far less sophistication and there's not a whole lot of understanding. I've actually dealt with that personally. Local problem. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.